nice to see all of you this morning from wherever you've come from. We're so glad you took the time to worship with us here this morning on this very steamy weekend. How many of y'all enjoying the 90 degree weather? Come on now. Four of you, five of you. I, I don't know about you. Yeah, but I'm, I'm actually even rocking the short sleeve shirt. Don't normally do that. And then I guess there's a meme flying around um, because Zach and I dressed alike today. So uh, who wore it better? Uh, polka dots or polka dots? Zach is younger and better looking, so I'm sure it was him. But anyways, you think our staff would be spiritual today. But anyways, uh, yeah, enough about all of that. So good to see you today. Uh, hey, before we dive into the message this morning, um, you know, we have a lot of cool things going on this summer. We have our outdoor services that are coming up. Uh, actually, we have our first one on Father's Day, just two weeks from now. Bring it in the big stage, LED wall screens and all that good stuff. And we are giving away a Weber grill. Um, some, uh, some lucky dad, I made the mistake in the first service, I didn't have enough coffee yet this morning. And I said every father was going to get a Weber grill. We can't afford that. Um, <laughs> I had a cor cor correction there. Uh, I've never owned a grill over $199, so I don't even know what it's like to have a Weber, but there's some lucky man is going to win a, a take home a Weber grill that day. It's out there in the lobby if you want to go salivate over it. Um, nevertheless, uh, well, we have a lot of cool things, as you heard, VBS is coming up. Um, but one of the things I want to draw your attention to real quick, um, and that is going into the fall, we're going to be bringing back a, a small group, life group program that we had done about a year and a half ago called Freedom. Um, it is one of the most powerful, um, fruitful life group semesters I've ever been a part of. We began it, right? We didn't really realize we began it in January of 2020, not knowing we would be in a global pandemic. And we had to pause the, uh, actually had to kind of pretty much stop the series. But basically what it is, it's a, it's a small group series that goes for 12 weeks. And really the whole thing is to help you and I take some next steps in our walk with God to walk in the freedom that God wants us to, to live in. And it's a great way not only to grow spiritually, but to build some friendships and relationships through small groups. And we had over 300 people involved in the freedom semester, and we had to stop it. And the really cool thing about the semester is it culminates on week number 10 with um, just kind of like a big spiritual enrichment weekend, which we are going to go ahead and do this year. So we're going to start this in September. And we're going to do the big retreat uh, right here uh, shortly before Thanksgiving, and then it'll all kind of be done before the holidays kick in. Um, but it is an incredible, incredible uh, teaching. It will show you how to walk in victory. It'll help you to take some next steps in your walk with God, to open your life up to the work of the Holy Spirit. It is life-changing. And the reason why I'm telling you this now is I'm kind of asking you to think about uh, joining a group in the fall. They'll start the week of September the 12th and run up uh, just to the actually beginning of December. And also we're looking for life group leaders. If you led a freedom group previously, we would love to have you back to lead one. Um, also, if maybe you've never led a group, but you think you might want to lead one of these, we would love for you to do that. Uh, just to let you know, all of the teachings will be done by me via video. So that way you don't have to feel like you have to teach necessarily. You just need to facilitate. And uh, we'll be, have some groups that will meet in the church. Some of them will meet in homes around town. But we would love for you to be a part of this. I think it will truly be life-changing. Keep your eyes open. You're going to be hearing a lot more about it. But if you don't mind, wherever we, you are today, let's go ahead and stand up for the reading of God's Word this morning. If you're new with us this morning, uh, real simply, we are a Bible-believing church. And in our three weekend services uh, we just like to stand up and honor God's word. And uh, we've been in a series since the beginning of the year, longest series that I think I've ever done. And it's simply a series called Hashtag Jesus. If you know anything about social media, that's how you follow content online. And our commitment, my commitment to you as your pastor, is to help you in 2021 to walk with Jesus Christ more intimately than you've ever walked with him to uh, follow him more passionately, to obey him more completely than ever before. Uh, if you do that, I promise you, this is going to be a great year, regardless of what you go through in life. Uh, and that's my hope. Last week, we talked about hashtag treasure, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That we don't just live for this life. How many of you know this life's short? 
but we live for eternity. That's forever. And today what I want to talk to you about is a, a simple message called hashtag don't worry. Anybody struggle with that once in a while? Anybody like me? I, I think in my life personally, this is probably one of the areas over the, my many years of serving God that God has worked the most in my life, an area that I probably needed the most is not to worry, right? It's so easy to worry. There's so many things. Anybody ever lay awake at night and you play that what if game? What if this happens? What if my boss does this? What if the market does, does this? What if the industry goes like this? What, I got this pain in my side. What, what could it be? You know, we, we worry and we lose our peace and we lose our joy and it, and it robs us of the joys of living. It robs us of the joys of God's presence in our life. God did not call you and I to live with anxious worry, but he called us to live in confidence and faith and peace. So we're going to go ahead and look at some, <clears throat> excuse me, some very famous words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6. Um, this is what Jesus said to us, to all of us. He said, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. It's good stuff, right? That word life means any area of your life, your finances, your career, your kids, your health, your relationships what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things. I love this part. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Father, we pray this morning that you would help each and every person, those that are here, those that are watching, that God, you would help all of us to walk by faith. You've called us to walk by faith and not by sight. We thank you, Father, that you love us and you're in control and you've called us to walk in peace and faith and trust and not to have anxiety, not to worry. The future's in your hands and we thank you for that today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. And you can be seated this morning. And as you are, you know, I was thinking back over the last 20 years um, <clears throat> of life and what the last 20 years has been like for us in our country in fact, you heard Daniel getting up here. Where were you 20 years ago? Um, I was thinking about Daniel. I mean, Daniel was up here. He was in third grade. And anybody else in third grade when you were 20 years ago? Anybody? <laughs> Some of y'all laughing. Anybody long since high school 20 years ago? Uh, anyways, that being said, I was thinking back over the last 20 years and you know, looking back over some major things that uh, our world has endured over the last 20 years, I think that it leaves one big word for all of us, and that is a word called uncertainty. <clears throat> um, I think for all of us, that's one of the things that we all as humans deal with, is as much as we feel like we're in control, things happen in life that show us that we're really not in control. Um, all you have to do is go through a family crisis, or all of a sudden the industry that you work in changes, and suddenly you realize that maybe we're not as in control as we think we are. For example, remember back in 2001, remember where you were on 9-11? I remember exactly where I was that day. Um, Mondays are the day that I typically take off. Even back then I did. I was, that morning on 9-11, I was out golfing with a mentor of mine, and uh, we were out playing a round of golf, and we came in at the, the nine-hole turn, and we went in to grab a hot dog, and we went in there, and uh, the greenskeeper, this is a small little course up in Michigan, and this greenskeeper comes running in, and he's like, oh my gosh, he's in planes, just crashed into the, the World Trade Center, and he flicks on the TV, and I almost couldn't believe my eyes in that moment. But suddenly, you know, we thought terrorism and, and all that was something we were going to have to fight overseas, but it wasn't going to affect us here. And then suddenly people began to realize, are we as safe as we think that we are in our country? 
And then we began to get our bearings back and get our legs back. And then we went through the 2008 Great Recession, which was the greatest financial crisis our country had faced since the Great Depression. Uh, just seven years later, that's what we went through. And uh, a lot of people lost everything during that time. Businesses folded up. People lost their life savings. People's entire industries changed. People lost their houses. And suddenly people were realizing, you know, am I as financially secure as I think I am? What does the future hold for me financially? And then we got our legs back from that, and the economy started turning around. And then last year we had COVID-19 come and hit us. And suddenly, who would have ever thought in January, when we're ringing in the new year and we're doing all these great things, that suddenly there would be a global pandemic that would literally shut the world down, that we would be shut down. You'd be working from home or not working at all. Church would be completely online. I mean, and then all of a sudden, now we're realizing some of us lost family members and friends and people that we love, and they got sick. And so you can see over the last 20 years, the things that we face when we realize is, is in control as we think we are, we realize that honestly sometimes we're not in control. Just look at some of the major things that have happened in our lives. But let's bring it down to your life individually. Let's think about your life. What are the things that keep you awake at night? Um, what are the things that keep you from being able to rest? In fact, I was doing a little bit of reading this week and in a, a Psychology Today article, they were talking about the top things that people worry about. And the first thing that people worry about most, they say, are finances. So you're worried about your, your financial well-being. Am I going to be able to retire? Am I going to be able to help my kids get through college? What's going to happen? And then the next thing would be your career. You know, people worry about their careers. You know, am I going to continue to climb the ladder at this place? Is there something different for me? Am I going to make it here? What's going on? Does my boss really like me? Are they really going to do the things that they say? You know, you're concerned about your career. Other people, they say, are worried about their relationships, their family. Maybe you worry about your kids. You worry about your spouse. You have some important relationships in your life that um, you're uncertain about those relationships and the choices that those people are making. And then for others, it's health. You know, you get that pain. You got that pain in your side, and you're laying in bed at night going, you know, my, my great-grandma died of cancer, and my grandmother died of cancer. Oh, my goodness, do I have cancer, you know? And you lay there at night, and you're like, what's going on physically? And all the different things that many of us worry about. And uh, if you're here and saying, you know, oh, yeah, that really hits home for me. I'm a, I'm a warrior. I've been open with you. I think that's, this is probably the one area of my life that I think over the last 20 plus years, God's worked in my life the most is uh, not worrying and just trusting God in the various seasons of life when you're a leader and you have a lot of responsibilities. Sometimes it's easy to be given in to worry, but actually worrying is very common. In fact, in a recent study, uh, out of the people, all the people that were polled, 86% of the people in this latest study that I read said that they were worriers. As a matter of fact, um, out of that worrying, they said the average person that worries, check this out, worries one hour and five minutes a day. Think about that. An hour and five minutes, if you happen to be one of those worriers, on average, the average worrier gives up an hour and five minutes a day to just worrying about what might happen in the future. That equates to 12 hours and 53 minutes a week, but check this out. If you live the average lifespan and you are somebody who worries, that you will actually worry away over five whole years of your life. Isn't that crazy to think that you and I might be robbed of the peace and the joy and the enjoyment of today because we're so worried about tomorrow that we actually worry away five years of our lives? Is it any wonder why Jesus, in the greatest sermon he ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, he would attack worry and he would attack anxiety? Because honestly, a lot of the things that we worry about simply just don't come to pass. In fact, in the, the one study that I was reading, they said that 91.39%, where do they come with the 039s? I, I don't know, but 91.39% of the things that you and I worry about never happen. Isn't that interesting? So like much, the bulk of the things that you and I worry about never materialize. Only 8.61% of the things that you and I lay awake at night and worry about actually come to pass in our lives. So let's kind of break it down. Let me kind of just define for you what worry and anxiety 
simply is. Simply put, um, anxiety or worry, it's distress about future uncertainties. Um, so really, our worry and our anxiety is always rooted in the future. So what happens is, is you and I think about the what-ifs of tomorrow. What might happen to my industry? What might happen to my career? What might happen to my children? What might happen to my health? And what we do is our imagination that God gave us for very good reasons can be used against us, and you can be thinking of all the possibilities of all the bad ways things could play out in your life and really be robbed of the joy of today. In fact, the great Chuck Swindoll said it like this. He said, what worry does is it pulls tomorrow's storm clouds over today's sunshine. Isn't that so true? That literally what happens is through worry and anxiety, we pull the what-ifs of tomorrow, these rain clouds, and we pull them over to today's sun. We don't enjoy this day because we're so worried about tomorrow. And let me tell you, worry impacts us in ways we would never imagine. In fact, there are many negative side effects. If you're following along in the sermon notes today or, or on the app, you'll, you'll notice that. Look what Proverbs teaches us, the book of wisdom. It says, an anxious heart weighs a man down. So what does that mean? It weighs you down. When you are anxious and worried, it robs you of your energy. In fact, um, prolonged um, worry and anxiety leads ultimately to depression. So you can come to a place where you're actually depressed. In fact, when you look at this word worry, it's, it's kind of interesting. In the Greek language, the word worry, it comes from two root words. The first root word is divide, and the second one is the mind. And so what happens is when you and I are worried and we have anxiety in our life, our mind is divided. We're having a hard time focusing on here because we keep projecting about what's happening over there or in the future. And what happens is it causes us not to be very productive right now because you can't focus. It affects our relationships. You can't give your best to your wife. You can't give your best to your kids or to your husband. Why? Because you're all worried about what might happen in the future. In fact, early on in, when I was in ministry and I was kind of getting my feet wet and I was dealing with all the challenges of if you lead in any area of life, you know what it's like, right? Um, we all have different stresses that come with leadership. And in the midst of that, I remember it, the kind of worry, and I, it was kind of getting the best of me for a season. And my wife, Christy, I love the way Christy operates. She just, um, she got to this place where she would clap her hands, and she'd say, hey, where are you? We'd be out to dinner, and she'd be like, hey, where are you? And she literally helped me to yeah, here I was. I mean, I'm, I'm at dinner with my beautiful wife, and I'm sitting here, and my mind is going a million miles an hour about all this other stuff. We miss the joys of our relationships because we're so concerned about what might happen tomorrow. It steals the joy and peace of today. It robs us spiritually. It literally robs us spiritually. When you look at the parable of the sower, the word of God being the seed being sown, the Bible said that the, the word was unfruitful in one of those men's lives because of the cares of this world. So worried about making money, so worried about getting ahead, so worried about the future and all of that, that the word of God didn't even bear fruit in their life because they were so focused on just making it here in this life. It robs us spiritually and actually it robs us physically. Um, Johns Hopkins Hospital years ago did a study and they found out, sim simply put, worriers do not live as long. If you are a chronic worrier, if you're somebody that deals with a high level of worry and anxiety in your life, Statistics show you will not live as long. In fact, uh, the great Charles, Dr. Charles Mayo of the Mayo Clinic, look what he said. He said, worry affects the circulation, the heart, the glands, the whole nervous system. He said, I have never met a man or known a man to die of overwork, but I have known a lot who died of worry. And isn't it true? It affects your body. It, it literally, you can worry yourself to death. You can worry yourself sick. And here's the bad part about it ultimately, how many of you know, worry accomplishes nothing, doesn't it? It accomplishes absolutely nothing. All your worry does is rob you of your today. In fact, look what Jesus said. He said, can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? You can't, right? By worrying, we can't make our lives longer. By worrying, you're not going to change your, the economy. You're not going to change your health. You're going to make your health worse. Uh, so obviously, it's like, kind of like running on a treadmill. You know, there's a lot of activity happening, but you're not going anywhere. And that's what happens. We wear ourselves out emotionally and because, and physically because we're so worried about what might happen in our lives. But here's the truth today. 
The truth is that God wants you and I to live in the worry-free zone. Isn't that good? God called you and I to live in the worry-free zone. God did not wire you and I to live with a whole lot of anxiety and all that. And some of you know what anxiety feels like. From worry, it goes to anxiety. Worry is in your mind. A psychologist told, said it like this. They said, worry is in your mind, but anxiety you feel in your body, right? It's like your heart rate goes up and you, you, your blood pressure goes up and you feel that. When you live with long, sustained periods of that, it will rob you. God did not wire us to live that way. He gave us that fight or flight to get out of trouble or in, a, in the midst of a crisis. But outside of that, you can't live like your life is a crisis. We can't live that way. God called us. He didn't wire us that way. He called us to live with peace. Notice what the Bible says here. Look what Jesus says. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. What does that apply to? Every area of your life. In the Greek language, that literally means your life in total. Like, don't worry. Don't lay awake at night wondering what's going to happen. Don't let your, your, uh, your joy be stolen. Don't ruin these precious moments with your kids as they grow because you're so focused on what might happen tomorrow. Now, some people will look at me and say, well, Pastor Matt, does that mean I shouldn't have, isn't, isn't it smart to have concern? I mean, shouldn't I be concerned about things in life? And I would say, yes, it's okay to have concern. Even the Apostle Paul said he was concerned about the churches that he was overseeing. Um, I'm, I'm a pastor. I, I work with a lot of people. I have love for a lot of people. Um, I'm looking out for the welfare of the future of this church. And yes, there's days that I have concerns about people or things or situations. There's nothing wrong to be concerned. The difference between concern... Concern, I say, saying, I see some things on the horizon. We better make, do some things today to maybe steer around that. Here's what worry does. The difference between concern and worry is that worry leaves God out of the equation. See, concern is God's got it. I know God's got it. Give me wisdom to deal with it when it comes. Worry is I don't know that God's got this. I'm not sure he's going to work it out. I'm a little bit scared. Oh, my gosh. See the difference there? One is in faith, believing, and one is in complete fear. And God did not wire you and I to live with fear. We've been wired by God to, to live by faith and to trust him. So I want to go to war on worry for a few minutes today. Uh, I have a few minutes left to share with you, and I want to give you three things today that Jesus told us. I'm, I'm not telling you these things. Jesus told us that if you and I will apply these things to our lives, it will help you to defeat worry and anxiety in your life. Y'all ready? It all starts with our focus, right? Whatever you and I focus on grows, correct? Psychologists tell us whatever you focus on grows in your life experience. The Bible says whatever you focus on grows too. What did, G what did uh, David say in the Psalms? He said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Now, when you magnify the Lord, are you actually making him any bigger than he is? Can we make God any bigger than he is? No. When you magnify the Lord, he's becoming bigger in you. Your faith is growing. You're seeing a bigger God. So we want to focus on the right things today. And here's three things I want us to focus on. Jesus tells us, number one, is to focus on the Father's providential care for you. Look what the Bible says right here. It says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of not much more value than they? I don't know about you, but man, creation is amazing to me. Like, I love to look at this creation because it just makes me in awe of God. You know, when I sit out at the stars at night, I mean, I'm just amazed. And, I mean, look at look what he says. He said, hey, just look around in creation. Look at the birds of the air. They don't, they don't sow or reap, but God feeds them. Coolest thing happened to me. Like, a, several weeks ago, I, I try to eat out healthy. Does anybody try to eat healthy? Try, right? The key is try, um, I do really good in the morning. I'll have some coffee and a protein bar. I eat a chicken salad for lunch. And then I buffet at night. And that's a bad thing. Does anybody love to eat and graze while you watch TV at night? Oh, that's my nemesis right there. Um, anyways, but I saying all that, I went to Wendy's one day for lunch. I go there often for lunch. And you're like, well, Wendy's isn't healthy. Yeah, if you eat a chicken salad, it's healthy. It's cool. You can do that. And so I got my... Apple pecan chicken salad. Um, and I was sitting out back, so I went through the drive-thru, <clears throat> and I just wanted a few minutes to relax, so I was 
sitting in the parking lot, and there's this little grass patch in the back, and I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, this bird flies down, Whoop! and I'm eating a salad, and I look over, and I see a bird there. Next thing I know, he stabs his little beak down in that dirt, and he pulls out the biggest slimiest looking worm you'd ever seen. Nightcrawler, boy, I just pulled it whoop, right up. And I'm sitting there, don't know what to, whether to vomit or think that's really cool. <laughs> and I stopped and I said, my goodness gracious, look at that. It was like God was giving me while I was eating a little lesson. Like, Matt, you worry about a lot of things, bud. You got a lot on your mind right now. How are you going to take care of your family? How are you going to take care of the church? How are you going to do this? How are you going to navigate that? Look at that bird. Do you see a bird behind a combine? Ooh, you know, bringing in the harvest? No, right? Isn't it amazing? Like, <laughs> that is a funny thought, isn't it? Um, but do you, do you really see that? You know, like this morning, I get up, I get up really early a couple days a week. I, I get up early every day, but Sundays is like 5 a.m. I was up studying this morning. There's a certain time that my dog has to go out for a second time. Y'all know that why, right? And so about before I got in the shower, I opened the back door and you know, we have an old, older fixer up at home, but we have this really cool big backyard, and it was kind of foggy, hazy this morning, and I let, I let Harley out. Well, he took off like a shotgun, and I look, and there's deer in my backyard. And um, it's kind of funny because I think the deer know that he's got an electric fence because they, they've interacted enough where the deer's just sitting there going like, what are you going to do about it, bud? You know? And uh, here he is, just gra- the, the deer's just sitting there grazing. Think about how easy that is. Do you think that deer was up all night worrying about my dog? Probably not. I mean, you think about the way, I mean, just look at, and and look what the Bible says. If God, the Bible says a sparrow does not fall from the sky in the middle of the forest, in the middle of Brazil, without the Father knowing. Do you realize the Bible says the hairs on your head, or the lack thereof, are numbered? All right. Yeah, but God knows all of that. And look what he's trying to say to us, that that he's provident. How many of y'all believe that God's in charge? Do you believe God is sovereign? Do you believe God is, there's a theological term that people call God, he's provident. He's providential. The word providence, it actually comes from a Latin word meaning seeing ahead of time or making provision beforehand. Can I tell you something today? If you love Jesus Christ and you're in this room and you're truly trying to serve Jesus Christ, can I tell you God's already been to your future? Do you know all the things that you need? He's already figured out how to provide for. So why are we laying awake at night worried about it? He's already got it taken care of. He knows where you're supposed to be in your career. He's got the, I mean, I look back over my life and I'm like, I could have never done that. Could have never figured that out. But yet God did. And yet, (laughs) I'll be real with you, I wasted some nights worrying about and I look back, I'm like, why did I worry? Because God, and look at the Bible, God, God said, listen, if, if he cares enough, your father, think about your father. That's what one of the big things Jesus came to reveal to us is the father. You and I have a loving heavenly father. Regardless if you had a good father or not so good father, you have a heavenly father that's crazy about you. He loves you. He wants the best for you. He didn't call you to live a horrible life. He called you to live a life that honors him and to enjoy his provision in your life. So let me just get to the brass tacks of it. That is the root of fear and worry and anxiety is really a lack of faith and trust in our Heavenly Father. In fact, he was rebuking some people a little bit nicely in this moment. Look what he said. If that is how God clothes the grass, so he says, look at the the flowers. Even Solomon in the height of his wealth wasn't dressed like one of these flowers is dressed. In the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Listen, you of what? Little faith. You see, we're either in faith and we're in trust or we're in worry and anxiety and fear. You're kind of in one of the camps, one or the other. Some days you're in faith, some days you're in worry, some days, you know, you can vacillate between the two. But God has called us to live by faith. We live by faith, we walk by faith, and not by what? Sight. If you and I live every day of our life by sight, we're not really living in the way God's called us to live. We walk by faith and not by sight. And so the great George Mueller, I've told a lot of his stories over the years. I like what he said. He said, uh, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. And the beginning of faith is the end of anxiety. 
So when you and I can rest in the providential love of God, know we're serving him, know we're following him, we can rest in his love for us, and we're in faith in that moment, and we are no longer in fear. But what happens is, and this is where I think the devil attacks us. Let me be honest with you. We have an adversary, and one of the things that he always tries to do is attack the character of God. Remember when Adam and Eve were in the garden, and the serpent came, and he said to Eve, did God really say that to you? No, God's actually holding out on you. God doesn't really want you to be happy. He's trying to control you. And he knows if you eat that fruit, you're going to be smart like him. What did he do? He tried to diminish the character of God in the eyes of Eve, and it worked. Then you have Job who lost everything he had in his life, and, and literally the devil was saying to him and kind of said through his wife, why don't you just curse God and die? But Job refused to do that. He believed God was good. He believed God was going to work it out. But the idea is the enemy's always trying to tell you now you can't trust God. He doesn't really have the best in store for you. He's not really going to work this thing out. You've got to take it on your own shoulders. I, I don't know. But I can tell you what. When I look back over my life, 25 years of doing this full-time in ministry, I look back and I'm like, my gosh, why did I worry? Have you ever done that before? Even our first couple years of running the church here, um, you know, I, I laugh, you know, with, with some of our leaders. We're like, why do we worry? Like, why was I even worried? Like, God had it figured out the whole time. In fact, look what, um, I like what the Believer's uh, Bible commentary said about worry in this particular section, in their commentary. They said, worry is a sin because it denies the wisdom of God. It says he doesn't know what he's doing. When we worry, we're like, well, maybe God doesn't know what he's doing right now. It denies the love of God. It says he doesn't care. And we somehow maybe believe in our heart that lie that maybe God doesn't care. And then it denies the power of God and says he isn't able to deliver me from what's causing me to worry right now. Like, that's why it, faith is what pleases God. When you and I trust him and walk in faith, that honors God. And so that's what we need to make sure that we do. Here's number two. So the first thing is just rest and, and focus on the way that God's caring for you. And here's number two is focus on seeking and serving God first. Notice what he says right here at the beginning of our passage today. He says, therefore. Y'all know this, right? Anytime you see the word therefore in the Bible, you have to know what therefore is there for. Y'all with me? So when I see therefore, I got to know what therefore is there for. Okay. Spaghetti. All right, go with me. Therefore is referring to the passage before it. The passage before it is what we talked about last week. What did God say? Don't spend all of your time and energy storing up treasure on earth where moth and rust and thieves steal and destroy, but, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy. What he was telling us last week is don't spend every ounce of your energy building life here. Think about eternity. Life is 70 or 80 or 90 years if we're blessed here. But it's eternity there. But sometimes we put all our eggs in this basket and we don't think about God and live with God in mind and live for the purposes of God. And it's all about, I was telling you that, you know, last week that I'm always concerned about young families. We have a lot of young families in our church. And, and I worry about some of these young men and young women that are extremely talented and gifted and blessed. And man, they're just, they're doing awesome things in life. And that's awesome. Like, I applaud that. God's proud of that. But here's the danger. You can get so caught up in that in chasing the allure of this life, that we spend our whole life living for this life and don't prepare for that one. Um, that one is forever. And so Jesus is saying, listen, therefore, don't worry about all that stuff. Work hard, it's a value. Do that. But, but think about the life beyond this life. Because life's more, look, do you not worry about what you eat or what you drink? Look what he says. He goes on to say, is not life more than this stuff? Isn't life worth more than money and a bank account and a nice house and a nice car? There's nothing wrong with any of that. But when all that is, that whole focus of my life is that, that's when we can begin to miss it. So look what he says, verse 33, the famous verse. He says, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So seek first. What does it mean to seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness? Let me tell you a quick little story I read. I thought was a pretty cool illustration of this. Um, the story I read was about a painter 
Some of you might know the name James Abbott Whistler. Anybody maybe refer? He was a famous, famous painter. And I heard a story about him that he was auctioning off some of his paintings. And on one particular day, he sold a painting of his to a millionaire. And this man had a mansion. And he came to Mr. Whistler and said, Mr. Whistler, since I bought this painting, will you come to my home and show me where it would be best displayed in my home? And Mr. Whistler said, for sure, yeah, I'll come over. So he came to Mr. Whistler's house that day. And I, I mean, sorry, Mr. Whistler came to this, this millionaire's mansion that day. And when he showed up, the millionaire was taking him through his house and says, you know, Mr. Whistler, what do, you, what do you think about my great room? I think this is the biggest, nicest room in my house. We should probably use this room. And Mr. Whistler kind of nonchalantly maybe nodded. And then he walked over and he said to Mr. Whistler, he's like, how about this wall over here? Would it look good over here? Mr. Whistler just kind of, uh, Mr. Whistler just kind of looked at him and then he walked over. He said, how about this wall? Would it look good over here? And the painter Whistler just kind of looked at him kind of crosswise. Until finally when the man stopped, he said, well, Mr. Whistler, what should we do? And this is what the painter said. He said, I want you to take everything out of this room. Get it all out of here. Take out every bit of furniture, every table. Take everything off the walls. Put this room to its barest state. And then we will walk back into this room. We will pick the wall that best accents this picture. We will hang it. And listen, then we will arrange all of the furniture in this room to accent this picture. Don't miss, what, don't miss the principle there. See, a lot of times what we do is we say, I, wanna, I have all these dreams, I have all these goals, I have all these aspirations, I'm going to do, 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 and then I'm going to add God on to bless me. Right? It's the add-on Christianity. I'm going to do, 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 and then add on Jesus so I get blessed. Bless. Ooh. Right? Jesus said, no. Chuck all that aside. Don't give up your dreams. Just go with me. Put it all aside. Seek Jesus first. His kingdom first, his plan first, his will first. Arrange your life around him first. He's number one. He's the pursuit of my life. He's whom I'm serving. He's whom I'm living for. And everything else in my life I will arrange in order with him being first. Jesus says when you do that, I'll take care of your every need. I'll open all your doors. I'll take good care of you. I'll bless you. And you don't have to live with worry. That's a good deal. So let me give you practically. Here's three things quickly. Number one, to seek the kingdom first means to know him more intimately daily. Like, so let me give you some practice. How do I do that? Number one, just go after Jesus. Spend time praying every day. Get to know him. Give him the first and the best. Maybe in the morning or whatever. Spend time getting to know him. Read your Bible. Pray. Get in the word. You know, I'm, I'm proud of all of you here today. It's a beautiful weekend, and you're all in church the first day of the week, right? Putting God first, that's a wonderful thing. You're growing. Um, get into a life group. You know, do these things to grow spiritually. Here's the second thing, and that is out of love, seek to obey his commands. Notice how I put that. Out of love, seek to obey his commands. Here's where the Pharisees got it wrong. The Pharisees put all the rules above knowing God, and if you obeyed all the rules, then you could know God. Well, you're constantly defeated, right? It's not how we should do it. Fall in love with Jesus, seek him with everything you have, and out of that love that you have for him, then you will have a desire to adapt your life. His righteousness means adapting your life to his commands. I don't do it to be saved because I'm saved by what Jesus did for me, but when I fall in love with Jesus and I get to know him and I see how much he loves me, that I naturally want to obey him and conform my life and do what he said. Jesus said, if you love me in John 14, what? Obey my commands. So out of love, I obey his commands. And then lastly, um, I just serve him with my whole heart. Like, my whole heart. Be willing to give God some of your time. God wants your time to help somebody or to serve him. Give God your time. Um, your talents. All of you have gifts and talents and abilities God's given you. Let God use those. Help in the church, help through the church, help do, let God use you wherever you are. And then even be willing to give to God. You know, we believe in giving and tithing and all of that stuff. It's giving God my first and my best. Why? Because I, I know that God's my source, and if God needs anything of mine, he can have it. And when you live that way, you're seeking the kingdom first. Here's the problem. Look back at the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. 
so oftentimes they would get their eyes off seeking God first, and what would it lead to? It always led to poverty. Always led to a mess, right? But anytime they put God first, what happened? He took care of everything else. That's the principle. Seek God first. He'll bless your life in ways you never dreamed. And then here's my last point, and then we'll take communion. And that is focus on today. Notice how Jesus ends this. Verse 34. He said, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Worry and anxiety is always rooted in tomorrow. And the problem is God gives you and I grace for today. Do you realize that? Like God gave you a dose of grace when you got up this morning. And that grace is to give you the grace to handle any trial comes your way, any decision that you've got to make, God's going to give you the grace for it today. You don't have grace for Monday yet. So go enjoy the sunshine today. Go kiss your wife. Amen. Good. I heard one amen. That's, <laughs> thought the ladies would be shouting. All right? Um, go take a walk. Go enjoy this beautiful day God's given us. Spend some time with your kids and really focus on them today. Why? Because God didn't give you grace for Monday. I don't have grace for Monday. I don't know what Monday's going to bring. Could bring a headache. Could bring a blessing. I don't know. But notice what the Bible says. There's trouble. It'll have trouble of its own. We live in a fallen world. We're all going to face trouble. That's a part of living in this life. But God will give you grace to, to deal with that trouble when it comes. Look what the Bible says in Lamentations 3, famous section of Scripture. It says this, It is because of the Lord's loving kindness that we are not consumed because his tender compassion, his compassions, his grace never fails. They are new every morning, and great beyond measure is what? Is your faithfulness. So enjoy this day. Do what you got to do today and enjoy every moment of it. Don't get yourself focused on tomorrow or next year. Yes, you can be concerned and do, do certain things at certain times, but don't project into there. Don't live there. You miss today by worrying about tomorrow. Don't pull that rain cloud over today, sunshine. Enjoy this day. Do what he's called you to do. You're dealing with a sickness in your body. It's like, I've been dealing with this for years. How am I going to do it tomorrow? Don't worry about how you're going to do it tomorrow. Just do it today and trust God for his healing today. You know, you got a t difficult boss you're serving on Monday morning. When you get there Monday morning, ask for God's grace. How are you going to serve him on Tuesday? I don't know. God's grace will be there when you get there Tuesday. That's the idea. God's grace is there for every day. So here's my encouragement to you today. God wants you and I to live with faith. He wants us to live with trust. He wants us to live with peace and with joy. He wants us to seek after him with all of our hearts. And when we do that, guess what God does? He gives us everything else along with it. So don't live your life in worry and anxiety. Know that he's got your future under control. Focus today on God, the Father's care for you. Focus on seeking him first and focus on today. And I promise you, if we will obey Jesus' teachings, you and I will have peace and joy where we had stress and anxiety. Amen? All right, well, let's take communion today. We like to take communion on the first Sunday of the month. And as we do that today, this is a special day to do that. As we've been in the midst of this series, it's our moment just to focus on Jesus. What is communion? Is It's a time to remember what Jesus did for us. The bread that we eat represents God's broken body. It was hung on a cross for us. The juice represents his blood that was poured out that washes away all of our sins. See, Jesus did all the work to make us right with God. He did it all. And that's what we're celebrating. We brought nothing. He gave us everything. And out of that, we love and serve him and obey him because he loved us that much. And as we think about this, I have one little scripture I want to give to you before we take the communion this morning. And it's right here. I love what it says. It kind of hits the whole worry thing. I think it's here. Here it is. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? That's good news, right? If I'm seeking God's will first, if I'm seeking him first, he's for me. Um, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You know what Paul is saying under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? He's like, listen, God gave us his own son. Why wouldn't he help you? Why wouldn't he take care of tomorrow? 
Why wouldn't he worry? Why wouldn't he take care of? Of course he will. Let's trust him that he does. Amen. So the bread represents his broken body. The juice represents his blood that was shed for us. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads before we take the communion because God wants us all to take communion and he loves when we do that, but he wants us to do it with a good heart, with a pure heart. And so if you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I want to invite you to do it right now. Maybe you've never put your faith in what Christ did for you. You've never had that born again experience. This is a great time to do that. Maybe you're in a place where you served Christ at one time but drifted away. And um, just want to invite everybody. I'm just going to ask, I'm not going to embarrass anyone. I'm just going to ask everybody to pray this prayer, whether you're online or whether you're um, here today. If you've never put your faith in Christ, here's a great opportunity to do that. Could we all pray this prayer together? Just say this with me. Say, Jesus, I love you and I thank you that you loved me so much you came to earth and died for me. I put my faith in you today as my personal Lord and Savior. Please forgive me of all of my sins and help me to live for you. In Jesus' name. How we'll do communion is if you're on the floor, the ushers will release you from the back to the front. Just walk down to the table nearest you, grab a cup and go back to your seat. If you're in the balcony, just stay where you are. They'll serve you right where you are. You can go ahead and pull this little cellophane top off. It releases the bread. Then you can pull the tab. It releases the cup. I'll lead us all together in communion. Just hold on to it. And just let's think about the goodness of God while the band sings. And I will build my life As we're concluding this time, everybody getting served, we'll give it just a moment, but, you know, think about that for a moment, that God loved us so much, he gave his own son to die for us. Man, if you ever doubt God's love for you, just look at the cross. Just look at the cross. God, listen, if you were the only person on the face of the earth, Christ would have died for you. That's how we're loved. Father sent his own son to die for you and I. He cares about you. He cares about all the needs of your life. He's concerned about anything that concerns you. He didn't call us to live with anxiety and worry. He called us to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. The more we trust in his goodness, the less we worry. The more peace we have. The more we see God work in our life. And so as you hold up that communion, let's go ahead and just hold that bread up. That represents Jesus' body that was broken for us. He paid a terrible price for you and I. The punishment we deserve because of the sin of humanity, Jesus in his sinless perfection took that for us. Lord, we thank you for your body that was given for us today. In Jesus' name, you can eat that bread this morning. As you hold up that cup, that symbolizes Jesus' blood that was shed for you and I. His blood washes away all of our sins. Isn't that good? Like, I don't have to live with guilt and worry and condemnation of the past. If I've come to Christ, it's under the blood of Jesus. It's washed away. 
We become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Why? Because of his blood. Lord, we thank you for your precious blood that was shed for us. In Jesus' name.